anybody out there familiar with um, Pandora radio, internet radio? Yeah? So for those of you who don't know, Pandora is basically internet-based radio. But it's different than the regular radio that, um, or even the satellite radio that we're used to listening to. Uh, when we listen to a radio station in our car, we have to listen to every song played, right? So um, <clears throat> we can change the channel, but we can't change the song. We're stuck with whatever we're given. But on Pandora, you can enter different bands or singers or songs that you like, and then they use an algorithm based on that to figure out what kind of music you're in the mood for based on what you've typed in. And so it asks questions of itself like, is this rock? Is it soft rock or is it hard rock? Does it include antiphonal music? Is it, does it have guitar leads? Does it have a front man? It asks all of those questions, and then it analyzes what you like, and it can incorporate other songs and artists into the mix that are like that. And by each song that's played, Pandora puts a little thumbs up sign or a thumbs down sign, and every time you click thumbs up or thumbs down, that algorithm of your preference is strengthened and it plays more of the music you like. And so if you click the thumbs down sign, Pandora in the future will skip that band or skip that song or skip that type of music as it brings all these different kinds of music to you based on your preferences. So it's truly a completely customized radio just for you. We live in a world where that kind of customization of every area of life has kind of become the norm for us, hasn't it? I mean, how many of us actually order what's on the menu when we order at a restaurant, right? The first thing I do when I walk into Jimmy John's or when I walk into a restaurant is I look at what's included on that sandwich, and then I think, okay, I, I don't like mayonnaise. But I like everything else on that sandwich, and so I'm going to ask for it without mayonnaise. I'm going to try to remove uh, the parts that I don't like and just keep the parts that I, I do like. I mean, in, in our family, everybody eats, even something as simple as a burger, right? I mean, Burger King basically made their living on giving it to us our way right away. All right, so you can get whatever you want on your burger. In our family, with Eli, it's, it's just ketchup, none of that yellow stuff. He doesn't want yellow stuff. He doesn't want pickles or onions, just cheese and ketchup. With sterling, it's, it's, it's ketchup and the, the mustard, and it probably should look like it looks on television. <laughs> I mean, he thinks food is art. I mean, with hot dogs, it's, uh, Eli is, is, is ketchup with a bun. Aubrey doesn't eat buns, and so it's just the hot dog with ketchup to dip it in. Sterling wants his ketchup in a perfect straight line with the, with the mustard going like this across it, and if you don't make it that way, you better start over. <laughs> Even with something as simple as a burger or a hot dog, we want it our way. We customize everything, and we do the same thing in lots of areas of our life. And this kind of custom lifestyle and, and belief has kind of become the norm, and sometimes it's the way we approach the Word of God, too. You know, there's parts of Scripture that I like, and there's parts that I don't like. And so I keep the parts that I like, and I throw out or I ignore, or we don't preach about the parts that I don't like. You see, I, I, I like Jesus in the Beatitudes, right? I like the Sermon on the Mount. I like some of those texts. But I don't like Jesus when he talks about plucking out your eye or cutting off your hand. I, I don't like those scriptures. That, so I, I, don't, I don't like to deal with those. And so we, just like with Pandora Radio, just like with our preferences in restaurants and in other areas of our lives, we customize our view of scripture and ultimately that causes us to customize our view of God. It's like we have our own internal algorithm just like Pandora, and we're sorting through and processing the biblical data to say, I like this part, thumbs up. I don't like this part, thumbs down, and I'm going to keep the thumbs up, and I'm going to get rid of the thumbs downs. I'll ignore it. I won't read it. I'll even throw it out. Even Martin Luther, the great reformer, he struggled with this. He fell prey to this tendency back in the early 1500s. There was no Pandora back then. There was no Burger King back then playing to our tendency to want things our way. But he took the same approach to Scripture. In his early 1500s preface to the, his translation, his German translation of the New Testament, 
He said that St. John's Gospel and his first epistle, St. Paul's epistles, especially Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians, and St. Peter's first epistle are the books that show you Christ and teach you all that is necessary and good for you to know. Even though you were never to see or hear any other book or doctrine. Therefore, he says, St. James' epistle is really an epistle of straw compared to them, for it has nothing of the nature of the gospel about it. He was taking, he really wished he could throw James out of the Bible. That's what he wanted to do. But he, he, he'd already caused enough trouble in the church, and so he didn't. He kept it, and he said, oh, it's Scripture. Just don't read it. It's not worth reading. That was his attitude. Keep the parts you like. Throw out the parts you don't. And it's entirely possible that Jesus was being accused of having the same attitude by the people who heard him teach. He, he seemed to be encouraging, in their eyes, he seemed to be encouraging people to break certain parts of the law. And he was forever making himself unclean by touching uh, unclean people and spending time with untouchables. And he, he, he did things like healing on the Sabbath, which was considered work, and that was in clear violation in their minds, of, not just of small parts of the law, but of, of big parts of the law. I mean, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy? That's one of the Ten Commandments. And in their mind, Jesus was teaching people and, do, and modeling not honoring the Ten Commandments. And so his actions and his words were starting to kind of raise the ire and raise the eyebrows of many who feared that he was leading the Jewish people down a very dangerous path. And they feared that it would have implications not just for those people as individuals, but for the entire Jewish nation. And so Jesus looks at his disciples and he looks at the others who'd gathered around him as he offers the Sermon on the Mount and he says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. And by that he means the whole Testament. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now that's a huge statement. He said, I didn't come to cancel the law. I came to fulfill it. What did Jesus mean when he said that? First, we have to realize that Je Jesus is making a really huge claim about himself. The Jewish people knew that their scriptures pointed to the one true God, and this Jesus guy, powerful, yes, miracle worker, yes, great rabbi, yes, but still a former carpenter from Nazareth of all places. Remember um, uh, some of uh, Jesus' uh, people, uh, when they heard about Jesus, they said, can anything good come from Nazareth? We have towns around here that we take that attitude toward, don't we? And this Jesus guy comes along and says, all of this will find its fulfillment in me. I love it when people say, Jesus never claimed to be God. <laughs> really? Because what he's doing right here, he's saying, Isaiah's wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, Solomon's rose of Sharon, his lily of the valley, Moses' lion of Judah. Yeah, I'm him. And this isn't the only time that Jesus did that. St. Luke, in the fourth chapter of his gospel, tells us that Jesus was going to the synagogue in Nazareth, and it says where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And this so kind of like, Ruth just read the scripture, right? And the scroll of Isaiah was handed to him. And he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So they, they, they all think he's just reading these words of hope from Isaiah, right? He's just reading scripture. 
But then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And I'm not going to go into why, but the fact that he sat down was significant there. That's why everybody was, was staring at him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Um, what? <laughs> all your scriptures, they all point to me. That's what Jesus is saying here. Did Jesus just say he's the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy? Yes, he did. And in our text for today, he says, I'm the fulfillment of not just one prophecy. I'm, I'm the fulfillment of all the prophecies. In fact, even the law itself has been pointing you to me. And those scriptures, they contained within them the history of Israel. The history of the people of Israel. And Jesus was saying there that all of the history, all of history itself to this point, finds its fulfillment in him. So much of Israel's history was spent in anticipation of the great saving work of God. And Jesus says, God's saving work, God's final word, God's great act of salvation history is here now in me. In me, the kingdom of God, the rule of God, the reign of God, not the reign of the powers of this world, but the right and true reign of God has drawn near to you in me. Now, the Jewish people loved the law of God. They loved the word of God. It laid out before them the terms of their special relationship with God and the, the special calling that he placed on them to be the light to the nation. And it, at the beginning, it informed them, and then it reminded them that they, they could never fully reach the righteous standard that God was setting before them. And so hand in, in hand with the law, in fact, included in it was the means by which the people would be forgiven. This intricate system of sacrifices and offerings that were to be presented first at the tabernacle and later at, at, at the temple in Jerusalem at, at different times for different reasons, all culminating in the great sacrifice for all of the people on the Day of Atonement. And so on that day, the tenth day of the seventh month, Leviticus calls it the Sabbath of Sabbaths. Every Israelite would experience a new beginning by being cleansed from their sins and restored to that right relationship with God. And the Day of Atonement itself was, was the culmination of a great, ten, in the pinnacle of a great 10 day celebration called the Feast of Trumpets. And on the first day of the, so on the first day of the seventh month, the trumpet was blown, calling the people to come before God for judgment once a year. And on this day, the first day of the seventh month, the, the, the day of the Feast of Trumpets, we call it Rosh Hashanah today. The people were to repent and prepare themselves to stand before God in righteous judgment ten days later on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And the blowing of the trumpet signaled the beginning of that trial. And it was a trial for which every person knew the verdict. And that verdict was guilty. Guilty. Guilty of sin. You know, sin. I don't like that word. It's a three-letter word, but to me it almost comes across like a four-letter word, and it certainly does today. I don't like to write it. I don't like to type it. I don't like to think about it, and I certainly don't like to talk about it. I'm really not comfortable with that word especially when it's talking about my own behavior and my own being. Mistake? I like that word. I'm more than willing to say, yeah, I screwed up. I made a mistake. Is David willing to say that he screwed up on occasion? Yes. Does, does David screw up on occasion? Every <laughs> once in a while? I'm not going to ask you about her because we just won't go there. She's perfect. She's perfect. Is right. So, but... But, but does he ever say I've sinned? I don't. I don't like that word. 
I'm more than willing to admit I had made a lot of mistakes. You see, mistakes are like occasional lapses in judgment or something. It's occasionally thinking or doing something that comes across bad, right? But I had good intentions. I meant well. It just came across wrong. Even brokenness. I can even embrace brokenness. Brokenness is the impact of other people's sin. See, I'm more than willing to call you sinners. And brokenness is the impact of someone else's sin on me, right? Or someone else's mistakes. And I can deal, so I can deal with, with mistakes, and I can, I can even deal with brokenness. But sin? As a pastor, Andy Stanley says, sin makes me think of God. Sin makes me think of judgment. Sin would mean there's a giant moral absolute out there, and I'm accountable. I might have to beg for forgiveness, and I'm probably going to be punished. And that is exactly what the people of Israel and Judah, right up to the time of Jesus, reenacted every year on the Day of Atonement. On that day, the people gathered to worship God, placing their trust in Him to forgive their sins and to cleanse them, making them pure once again. And even the high priest, even the high priest was barred from entering the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, at any other time, on any other day but this day. And then he could go only with blood from the sacrifice plus a censer full of burning coals from the outside altar and two handfuls of incense, which when burning would form a protective cloud to shield him from the direct presence of God. In fact, the robe that he wore on that day had bells attached to it. And he had a string, well, they say string, really kind of a small rope attached to his ankle. And as long as they heard the bells ringing, they knew that he was still alive in the Holy of Holies. And if they stopped hearing the ringing, they could pull him out. He began by washing his entire body so that he was personally pure while he interceded before God on behalf of the people. And then the sacrifices were offered. First, the normal daily offerings that were offered every day. And then the festival offerings that would be a part of the feast later in the day. And then lastly, the offerings of atonement. And a young bull would be sacrificed, a perfect bull. And he would take some of the blood from that bull into the most holy place, and he would sprinkle the blood seven times before the Ark of the Covenant. And its lid, which we call the mercy seat, the seat of God in judgment. And this sacrifice itself served to cleanse the priests because they took upon themselves the sins of the people throughout the year. And so it served to cleanse the high priest and his family, the other priests. And then he came back out into the courtyard and he chose one of the two goats that had been selected and he chose them by lot, kind of by we would say rolling a dice or, or what, flipping a coin. And they were identical goats, and he killed the one chosen, and he re-entered the holy place and did as he had done with the blood of the young bull. But this time it was on behalf of the people of Israel. And then he came back outside, and he laid his hands on the remaining living goat that was supposed to be identical to the goat that was just killed, and he placed symbolically on that goat the sins of the people, and then that goat was let go into the wilderness. It was called the scapegoat. And this pattern was, was performed exactly that way year after year, decade after decade, century after century after century. And over those centuries, it became a part of the soul of the people, a constant reminder of God's holiness, of their sinfulness, and of God's gracious provision for their purity over and over and over again. I mean, think about how ingrained the pattern of our national celebrations have become in us, even things like the 4th of July. And we're just a little over two centuries old. They'd existed for well over a thousand years. We're just a baby. And they had done this for over a thousand years. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, all of that finds its fulfillment in me. 
All of that pointed forward to him. But Jesus meant more than that. He also meant that he would live under the law on behalf of the people, doing for them what they and we for centuries have been unable to do, live rightly before God. And then die before and then he would die before God as an offering of atonement once and for all. Think about the words of his cousin, John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The final Lamb. The one who would be sacrificed once for all people in all times in all places. And when Jesus died, the veil that protected that holy place that kept people from being consumed by the holy presence of God, that veil which was not a thin piece of lace but it was about four inches thick was torn in two. It was no longer necessary because atonement had been made once for all. And he took upon himself my sin and your sin and died as the perfect lamb. The pattern of atonement was was performed for centuries in anticipation of his once and for all sacrifice as he lived perfectly under the law and died under the law. Even when he went to John the Baptist, his cousin, to be baptized, John said, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You need to baptize me. And Jesus looked at him, and I can just see him smile and say, this needs to be done to fulfill all righteousness. This is what needs to be done. I need to live under the law for you. And so he did. And so St. Paul can say, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So in that sense also, Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament. The entire system of sacrifices, the law itself, pointed to him. He fulfilled the prophecies. They pointed to him. And he lived under the law, fulfilling it for us. Jesus, the good shepherd, became the Lamb of God. And because of that, he has become the lens through which we read Scripture. So when we read and we study the Old Testament, we find Christ at work in every letter, in every word, on every page, from Genesis 1 to the end of Malachi, that big part of the Bible that we don't pay much attention to except for the Psalms and then usually on funeral days. But we find Christ at work in every page. Some passages are harder to understand than others. But the Old Testament in its entirety brings us to the cross of Christ. And the New Testament in its entirety grows out of the cross of Christ. He is the centerpiece of every bit of it. We keep thinking the Bible is about us and it's not. It's about him and about what he has done for us. Do we find ourselves in his story? Yes, we do. We find ourselves receiving his grace. We find ourselves being, becoming citizens of his kingdom. And we find ourselves living as citizens of his kingdom, doing the things that he tells us to do, not to earn our salvation, but to express our salvation because of what he has done for us. And he says not even the smallest part of it, not even an iota, That's the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Or a dot. Again, in the Hebrew alphabet, that's actually just a small little seraph. It's a teeny little mark that's used to distinguish one letter from another. And it looks kind of like an apostrophe. Today, you might think of it as like the cross piece on a T that separates that from an I or an L, right? Not one little bit of it will be removed from the law of God. He didn't come to remove it or cancel it or cause us to have to ignore it. He came to fulfill it, and we find him in every word. And then he tells us how we're supposed to relate to that law. He says, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches other people to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. 
But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And he's about to illustrate what that means because he's about to walk us through these (coughs) statements where he says over and over again, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And he goes through four examples or five examples, and we're going to look at those over the next few weeks, and we're going to talk about anger, and we're going to talk about lust, and we're going to talk about oaths and loving our enemies and those things. And he takes those and he says, I didn't come to make this go away. I came to make it a part of who you are. I came to help it dwell inside of you. So does this mean we all have to eat kosher diets and men don't ever shave their beards? Sorry, David. No, it doesn't mean that. Does it mean that we can basically ignore it? No. Remember, we interpret Scripture through Christ. And so we go back and we read the Old Testament just like the early disciples did, and we begin to understand what those passages are telling us about Christ. You see, when Jesus was on the road to Emmaus and he came alongside two disciples who had followed him who did not recognize him, he opened the scriptures and he went back through the Old Testament and he taught them as they walked on that road how every word pointed to him. Every bit of it about him, pointing to him and fulfilled in him. It's about Christ. And it centers on him and it draws our focus to him. And it isn't just for us to understand with our heads. As with all Jewish teachers of his day, Jesus expected his followers to put into practice what he taught. It wasn't about gathering information, stuff to just think about, even to believe as we think about believing today as in, I agree with that. In Jesus' world, true belief was made visible through action. It became a part of who you are. And that belief made visible in the life, in your life and mine, the life of any believer is what makes someone great in the kingdom of heaven. Now look at what Jesus says next. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, who are the scribes and the Pharisees? We hear about them a lot. Especially when we read about the life of Jesus because they're constantly set up as opposing him. So who were they? The scribes were the ones who made copies of the Jewish scriptures by hand without error because they didn't have copy machines. So those copies had to be made by hand. And they were to teach the people because they understood them, because they wrote them over and over and over again. They understood what they said and they understood what they meant. And so their job was to teach the people what the law said. These were people who knew the law of God forwards and backwards. And they could recognize a single a copy with a single error in it, even a missing iota or dot. They could pick it up just by looking at it. They could do it in an instant. And the Pharisees were a sect of Jews who were, as one person says, mastering the Torah and all of its interpretations and rulings, and they were determined to live fully within the law of God. They were highly respected and influential people. They were not religious leaders. They were community leaders and cultural leaders, but they weren't religious leaders. They were primarily lay people, although uh, some scribes were also Pharisees. But they were determined to live completely within the law of God, and they were very influential wherever they went. They, like the scribes, knew the law of God forwards and backwards, and they could quote it to you today better than I can or anyone else could. They lived by its decrees right down to the dot or the iota. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he says to them, to enter the kingdom of God, you've got to do a lot better than these folks. It would be kind of like saying today, you've got to do better than Rick Warren or Francis Chan or N.T. Wright or Dallas Willard. But he isn't talking about doing more of the same. He's not talking about outdoing them at what they're doing. The word translated as exceeds here, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes, that word exceeds really points to uh, not 
um, doing just more. It's, it, it points more toward a completely different kind of righteousness. Not the degree or amount of righteousness. You see, they knew the Word of God forward and backwards, but they had missed the whole point. You see, the call of Christ isn't just to go to church and do good because that's what Christians are supposed to do. And it isn't to put our intellectual faith in Him and then sit back and live our lives as best we can and then die and go to heaven. That's all a part of it. But He's he's talking about understanding our own sinfulness, something that had been hammered into the Jews through centuries of going through the Day of Atonement, that in our sin, separated from God, we aren't capable of loving God at all. But realizing that Christ is the Lamb of God and that He came to take away the sin of the world. And based on that, we're supposed to place our faith in Him and to live as citizens of His kingdom now here on earth in whatever time we have left, as salt and light, as He's already told us, in the world. And then enjoy the fullness of the kingdom of God when we die or when he comes again. The call of Christ is because of Christ and in Christ to love God and to love others with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. When Jesus looked at one man and said, can you tell me what the greatest commandment is? The person said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, yep, you answered rightly. You got the answer right. Love God and love your neighbor. And that's something we can only do when we understand that apart from Christ, we don't have a right to walk into that holy of holies. But that in Christ... And because of Christ, that veil has been torn in two, and the day of atonement has been done once and for all. And we can't earn that. Nothing we ever do will earn it, but we can express the love of Christ in our lives, in word and in deed, sharing the love of Christ. Author Mark Galley, in his book, Jesus, Mean and Wild, said it this way. The difference between Jesus and the Pharisees is this. The Pharisees refused to touch any unclean thing. Jesus aims to make the unclean holy. That's the difference. That's what it means to truly understand who Christ is. We spend so much of our lives trying to avoid the unclean thing, the unclean people. Jesus came to make the unclean holy. That's why my friends Andrea, um, not this one, um, Andrea and Andy are working in Central or South America, in Bolivia, in La Paz, in the red light district with prostitutes. That's why George is working in Belize. That's why there's a hospital in Aswan, Egypt. That's why Jesus is reaching out, not with knife and sword, forcing people to come to him, but by taking the knife and sword upon himself so that we can come. And he says, I love you. And I am the final day of atonement. I came, not to help you do a better job of avoiding unclean things, but to make the unclean holy. And he begins with your heart and mine. Let's pray. Because that, my friends, is the gospel. That is good news. Father in heaven, we thank you that you sent the final lamb, that we no longer need to honor the day of atonement, that the people of this world, each one unclean, need not be avoided because you came 
to make the unclean clean. And you start with each one of us. May we celebrate that today. May we be reminded of that today. That you saw us helpless and guilty under the law. And rather than condemn and destroy us, you became like us. And you lived under the law for us. And you took our punishment upon yourself and offered to us not greater amounts of our own righteousness, but you offer to us the righteousness of Christ in exchange so that in our, with our faith in him, you see Christ and not us because our sinful selves died with him on the cross. So help us, Lord, as we follow the words of St. Paul and work out our salvation with trem fear and trembling, not working for our salvation, but work it out in our lives as we gain every day a deeper understanding of what it means to be a citizen of your kingdom, living under your rule first and foremost. So when people look at us, may they see people who are dearly loved by God, people in whom the Spirit of Christ dwells, and people who know how to love because we know how much we have been loved. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.